Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the 17th ThinkFest session. My name is Raina Saeed Khan and I'm an environmental journalist based here in Islamabad. And currently I write for Reuters and I write for Express Tribune and I focus mainly on climate change issues. Today we have um, on our panel the special assistant to the Prime Minister on Climate Change and the head of the Climate Change Ministry here in Islamabad, Malik Amin Aslam. He also wears the hat of elected Vice President of IUCN, which is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And this is from 2017 to 2020. We also have Rab Nawaz, who is a Senior Director of Biodiversity at WWF Pakistan. And he's had many years of field experience uh, working um, all in the mountains of Kohistan, along the mangroves um, of our coastal areas. And we also have Razali Dada, an award-winning and environmentally conscious architect and urban planner and he's based out of Lahore and he's also an active member of the Lahore Conservation Society. So let's, uh, before we just start our discussion, uh, let me just introduce just a couple of lines about Pakistan. Um, as you know, according to the Climate Risk Index um, 2020 that was launched in Madrid um, last year at the UN Climate Change Conference, um, Pakistan now ranks, and this is launched by German Watch, it's um, an advocacy group on uh, sustainable development. And Pakistan has been ranked fifth in its long-term ranking of those countries affected most by climate change, um, basically affected by extreme weather events. This index ranks countries most affected in the last 20 years. Uh, this means we are extremely vulnerable to climate catastrophes, uh, which affect our economy, affects our health, it affects our agriculture, it affects our ecosystems. Um, so let's start our discussion with Malik Amin Aslam Saab. And, uh, and we we'll hope to learn about what the government, this current government has done to mitigate the adverse effects of climate change uh, in this country. So Malik Amin Saab, is it true that Pakistan is a, is it true to say that Pakistan is a low emitter of carbon emissions yet suffers disproportionately from climate impacts? Um, what are the biggest climate change challenges that Pakistan faces currently in 2020? And also has the pandemic sort of pushed them out of the media's um, Headlights. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thanks, Raina, and uh, uh, I'm very glad to be on this panel. Uh, firstly, let me start by saying that, you know, yes, Pakistan is really one of the most affected countries uh, because of climate change, but we're not one of the big contributors. We are 135th on the list of contributions. So, so yes, we are, uh, you know, on the wrong side of climate injustice, I would say. Uh, but, you know, that's something that uh, we keep on fighting in the negotiations. But the fact of the matter is that Pakistan is in an inescapable position as far as climate change impacts are concerned. That has to do with, you know, uh, our topography as well as our geography. Uh, we are a country which is blessed with, you know, being on the, having the second highest point in the world, which is K2. And then we go down to sea level with, within 2,000 kilometers. So we've got, you know, very varied uh, climates in Pakistan, about 12 ecological zones, which is a blessing. But in terms of climate change, it's just also uh, something that has created our vulnerability. Because on the top of that, uh, that uh, high point is, is the third pole of the world, which are the Himalayan glaciers. And they, they store a lot of uh, the third high, highest amount of fresh water and the glaciers are melting. Uh, so I think uh, Pakistan is, is, uh, cannot escape from this, uh, this issue. But what we can do is to adapt our people, to adapt our infrastructure, and to get ready to face up to, up to this challenge, which the government is doing. Uh, the, you asked a question about what, is the, what are the biggest impacts in the year 2020. Uh, I would put you know, glacial melt on, on the top of that list. Uh, I just came back from the northern areas, Skardu, uh, where we have the glaciers. And one of the, uh, and we have started a project over there uh, on the glacial lakes out west. Large, it's a, it's a, a six billion rupee project, which is basically looking at, you know, uh, enhancing the adaptive capacity of the communities who are living over there. And we are focusing on, 20, on the 24 most vulnerable valleys in, in, in the northern areas and KP. Uh, but the starting thing that I found out over there was that when the project started in 2015, there were 33 critically endangered lakes. Now, what that means is that the, because of the melting of the glacier, uh, these lakes are forming and, and then they form uh, you know, behind the glacial walls. 
So they have the propensity to push the whole wall and then break the glacier. And that created, creates what is called a glob. So they were 30, we had identified 33 of these lakes in 2015. And the recent assessment, assessment that was done just three years after that, which is still being validated, but the figure over there is 133. So you know the lakes, the critically endangered lakes in Pakistan has gone up by 100 lakes. So that just shows you know, the, 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 uh, the uh, propensity of the challenge over there. And I've seen communities you know, who are living you know, just below these large, huge glaciers hanging over their heads and which, which could break and, and, and create uh, uh, issues. So that, that I think is, is a clear and present danger for Pakistan right now. Uh, but as I said, we had uh, uh, we have got a very good funding and a project which is on the ground right now, uh, which is looking at disaster management, which is looking at uh, you know beefing up the communities to deal with this uh, emergency situations, and also uh, you know working with the NDMA over there to create uh, disaster management uh, 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 situations. Uh, we are setting up 50 glacial uh, weather monitoring stations. So these are being put up on the glaciers to, to let us know as, as an early warning if the glacier is melting fast. And then there are 400 river discharge uh, uh, stations that are being set up so that you know, the melting of the water, uh, the, the glacier which increases the river flow can also be checked because all of this is, has an effect on the downstream also. You know, as I said, we are a very inclined country. So whatever happens in the north, very quickly travels all the way through the spine of the country. So that I think is the biggest challenge. The other challenge is, is the weather patterns which are shifting. And that has a direct impact on our agriculture. Uh, you know, the agriculturists in Pakistan, uh, the cropping patterns, uh, the way we do our agriculture, uh, when we crop our pat uh, patterns is all, sh is all changing because of climate change. The, the rains are coming at different times with more intensity. So you know, it's, uh, uh, the challenge of the climate change issue is that uh, uh, humans cannot adapt as quickly as the climate is changing. And that's a worldwide phenomena. And we are feeling that in Pakistan. Uh, luckily, we also have got recently got approved a very good project for climate smart agriculture, which is going to be done in eight districts as a pilot project, uh, and which is going to, and it's going to look at you know how these uh, uh, climate change uh, changes are occurring and how does the uh, agriculture community get ready to adapt to that. And once we have the results from those, they, they will apply it all over Pakistan. We are also looking at a, at a having a dialogue on climate smart agriculture led by the prime minister himself. So the new agriculturists, uh, they have issues, you know, the, the, because the rain pattern has totally shifted, especially in the Barani areas. Uh, and this year, the wheat uh, productivity dropped because of that. Uh, so they need to be taken on board their issues and then uh, we, should, we have to address them. Other issues are urban flooding, you know, again, we see it happening right now uh, in Karachi, in Lahore, uh, because, uh, you know, the intensity of the monsoons uh, is also changing. Uh, uh, more rain comes in smaller periods of time. So you know, all of this is, is linked to the climate phenomena. And then the one uh, other big issue on the table is, is the heat island issue. Now the World Bank came up with a report about three, four months back in which they uh, identified heat hotspots all over the world where it could become uh, unlivable uh, by 2050 if nothing is done. And six of those hotspots are in Pakistan. And they include six districts, uh, three districts in Sindh, which is Hyderabad, Sakkar, and Mirpur Khas. And in Punjab, it's uh, Multan, Sahiwal, and Bahar districts. Now, in these areas, if you don't plant trees, and because they, they change the microclimate, and you know the seven, eight degree difference in, in climate can occur if you have uh, a good canopy cover. If you don't do that, then these areas, according to that report, could become in in uh, uninhabitable. So you know these are the these are these are big issues, all of them. And uh, the government has got projects going on in all of them. Uh, but uh, you know we have to get ready for this challenge. It's a huge challenge coming our way. The pandemic, uh, yes, it, it's pushed back the 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 emergency of the climate issue uh, because obviously this this was a this was a bigger short short term challenge. But you know we'll inshallah. Uh, get out of the pandemic, uh, and, and Pakistan has done very well on that. But this other issue will keep on looming. It's not going away. Uh, we have to learn to adapt to it. And the policies and the government, uh, which are uh, this government and the previous uh, and the future governments have to learn to 
live with the environment and the economic reality of the situation. You just mentioned the report of German Watch, uh, on which we are number fifth in terms of the countries which are affected by climate change. But in the same report, we are number two in terms of the economic uh, losses that countries have borne in the last 20 years. So, you know, Pakistan is really up there in terms of uh, this challenge. Uh, so we have to take it seriously. Uh, it's not just the Ministry of Climate Change. It, it, it goes into the water, agriculture, you know, uh, economic, uh, uh, energy. All of these ministries get affected by this. And uh, uh, so, you know, this is something that we have to get up uh, to, to deal with. Um, I'd like to bring in Rab Nawaz now into the discussion. Um, so Rab Nawaz, what are the lessons that climate activists such as yourself, um, what have we learned from the pandemic? Um, will zoonotic diseases, you know, who jump from wildlife to humans become increasingly rampant? Um, can the illegal wildlife trade, uh, which occurs in Pakistan as well, you know, we have the pangolins here that are you know, being traded and sent to China, um, can it be curtailed? Thank you, Rana, and thank you for inviting me. So yes, I think though the, the, the science is not in about uh, whether this was started through zoonotic disease, I think the signs are, are clearly there that it was. So if you look at SARS, you look at Ebola, you look at um, MERS, uh, they were, um, even AIDS, uh, they were all, they, they came from animals. Um, so, it, yes, I think we're going to see more and more um, cases. Uh, there's two reasons for that. Uh, one is that the, the demand, we've seen the demand for illegal wildlife trade in the wet markets, which you've seen in, in Asia, where they prepare um, kind of uh, game meat into, into food, um, especially places like China, the demand has increased. So the, the, the quantity of, of animals being, being caught and, and processed has increased. The second thing is, and we, we know it's not just wet markets which are causing these, these diseases, it's actually the loss of habitat and it's, it's humans going into areas where very um, places where humans have never been before. They were exposed to viruses. We think AIDS came from gorillas and, and uh, so our, our kind of uh, um, um, thirst for, for converting land uh, from, from pristine forest into, into agriculture land. Uh, this is going to is is going to be is is going to see an increase. Uh, the other thing which is happening through climate change is that animals are moving. Uh, they are migrating because of places where they uh, inhabited. Uh, the, the climate is changing. They're unable to, to find food. There's too much disturbance. So the animals are migrating to new places. And again, when you have two species come together, there's always that that uh, danger that. Um, uh, a zoonotic disease uh, will happen. Um, and I think the lessons learned from us, I think I, I agree with Malek Sav that it has, it has put a bit of, it has put environment in a bit of a back burner. Though saying that, I think a lot of people have renewed their, their love, their, their realization for nature that is very important. What our um, uh, uh, fear is, is that we've seen economies collapse in, in, in all over the world. And we're very concerned of two things. One is that there's going to be a very um, carbon-driven recovery, uh, which I'm very glad to see in Pakistan is not the case. There's a green stimulus, which is a very good sign um, for, for Pakistan. Uh, and the other thing is that you know, standards are, uh, environmental standards may be reduced. Again, I, I hope this doesn't happen in Pakistan, but we've already seen some standards, some, some um, shortcuts being uh, put, introduced for industries, for example, for fishing. Uh, the fishing wants to get back, industry wants to get back quickly, and they're doing shortcuts. Um, so the sustainability of some industries are being compromised, and I think we have to be very careful and very vocal when we see this, this happen, because it's, it's a shortcut to getting the recovery back. Um, and I think we, it's too early to say how, how long it's gonna take um, uh, to recover. We have seen, obviously, in many cities in Pakistan, you've seen lower emissions, we saw blue skies. And I think, so the one thing which I took home is that, you know, if we're forced to, we can do this. We can bring pollution levels down, right down. We can live in a society where our consumer um, patterns can be reduced. So it, it's, it's a kind of a wake up call for us. Uh, for legal wildlife trade, it, it has to stop. Yes, Pakistan has uh, has huge issues. Again, I, I I must give credit to, to the to the 
uh, wildlife departments, uh, they they have taken it seriously. A lot of confiscations are, are being done from turtles for for pangolins, but it's it's uh, it is a, a growing trade, and it's a very lucrative trade. So I think if you look at, for example, drugs and uh, wildlife, the, the profits are the same, but the the risks are very low uh, for wildlife. So a lot more to be done. Um, we're really pushing that China closes these red markets, uh, at least reduce some of the, the risk of this happening again. But where there's a pull rate of the market, there's always going to be a risk. Uh, thank you, Rab Nawaz. And um, uh, now, Razali Dada. Um, we have seen many cities in Europe and around the world sort of adapt to the pandemic, um, you know, by increasing their pedestrian areas, encouraging cycling, etc. So what can we do practically to green our cities? Um, and, and tell us more about the afforestation Lahore campaign that you've been involved in. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Raina. I hope you can hear me. I think I had some connection problems. Um, so yeah, uh, you, 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 your question starts with dealing with the pandemic. So um, that's what every city or country has done uh, in terms of whatever suits them. But when it comes down to city um, and uh, being um, a pedestrian friendly city and pe people who are cycling out there and all that stuff, this is something that um, that's how cities used to be. Um, if you look at uh, a few decades back. Uh, and that's how people have now started voicing uh, in terms of how cities need to be again. There's a, there's a lot of push, uh, there's a lot of cycling groups out there now, and uh, uh, there's a lot of push to get some uh, pedestrian and public space back. Um, so this is not something that's alien to us, in, 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 I think in most of the world, but uh, in terms of you know, how to practically do it, um, it is not something that some uh, enthusiasts or some pressure groups can do by themselves. There needs to be some kind of, of a system of, um, let's say, implementation or, or deployment of uh, such initiatives or such concepts that needs to be worked out because it has to be done. Um, you have to be in hand with the, you know, uh, with the government or the administration and they have to have enough uh, sort of, um, uh, you know, organization uh, within themselves to um. you in every other neighborhood, people do spend a lot. Um. I think I think we're losing you, Raza. Um, okay, I think we sort of lost Raza, so um, we'll come back to him later. And uh, let me go back to Malik Amin Saab. Um, so, has Pakistan met? It's um, Sustainable Development Goal 13, which is uh, which calls for urgent action. Uh, yes, uh, Rana, that was a, you know uh, uh, some good news that came up uh, very recently is that uh, we were set a target under SDG 13, which is on climate action, uh, to meet by 2030. But we have met it 10 years ahead of time. Uh, there are reasons for that. Uh, you know, basically. Uh, climate change, the real culprits are in the energy sector and the forestry sector. Uh, if you look at both sectors, you know, if you're cutting down trees, you're adding to the climate change. And on the energy side, if you are screwing out, you know, carbon emissions, you're adding to climate change. So all the steps that you take uh, to, to uh, counter, uh, you know, these two things happening uh, adds up to the climate action, uh, uh, you know, SDG. Uh, so on the forestry side, we had the billion tree project in KP. Uh, which increased the forest cover in KP by 6%, uh, which is a, you know, a, a globally uh, acclaimed figure. Uh, it uh, you know, reforested about 6 lakh hectares of forest in the KP province. And now we are you know, emulating that all over Pakistan under the 10 billion tree tsunami project, which has got seven different plans for all the provinces of Pakistan, so, you know, going from mangroves right to the natural forest and the plantation forest. All of them are being enhanced and 
all of that adds to climate action because it sequesters carbon from the uh, from the air. The other side, on the energy side, which is not that uh, dealt with directly by our ministry, uh, we've also made some shifts towards uh, clean and energy. Uh, the the recent uh, uh, you know the the policy document that came out is now targeting 60% clean energy in Pakistan by 2025. Out of that, 30% is the big hydro, and then 30% is the small hydro plus the wind and solar. Uh, we we signed up on 1,200 megawatts of uh, stuck up wind projects. Uh, uh, you know about uh, uh, three four months back. Uh, uh, then you know we removed the cap. There was a criminal cap on on solar on, on, on renewable energy put up by the previous governments that no province could uh, could put more than 50 megawatts onto the grid uh, from that province by renewable energy. So I thought that was really a criminal thing to do because you know solar was exploding, but we could not give more than 50 megawatts onto uh, the grid uh, from any any uh, province. We removed that cap. The policy now is now in place, so you know that's heading in the right direction. Uh, also, recently we made a big stride in terms of CPAC, uh, that uh, about 20, 2400, 2600 megawatts of uh, signed up contracts for imported coal projects. Uh, these were to be set up in uh, Muzaffargarh and uh, Rahimiyar Khan. Uh, they were shelved. And instead of that, we've, we've started work on 3700 megawatts of hydro projects in the north. So, you know, this, this is also a big shift in terms of carbon emissions. Uh, then we have the EV policy in place, uh, which you know, when, when we get it on the ground fully, it will because transport is a big culprit in terms of the emissions. Uh, and as uh, Rab Nawaz pointed out, you know, in the COVID area we, era, we found out that uh, you know, just getting transport off the roads would clean up the cities, to clean up the air, uh, and you know, uh, it just showed us that uh, this is something. If it needs to be done, it can be done, and it leads to a better, uh, you know. Uh, uh, Air in uh, air quality, in, in, especially in urban areas, and it happened very quickly. So that's the beauty of it. That uh, you know, as soon as transport was locked down, suddenly you know, after one week, you could see the sky blue, and you know, people were seeing mountains from cities. So, so, but that just showed that if there is a will, there is a way, and 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 nature can always rebound back. So that was one of the silver linings of this COVID lockdown period. Uh, also, uh, we we recently shifted to the Euro five fuel which is now available in the petrol stations, that reduces the emissions by almost 10, uh, a factor of 10. So, so all these steps uh, collectively, I think, have uh, uh, allowed us to uh, uh, get the SDG uh, uh, 13 target achieved 10 years ahead of time. Uh, we will keep on moving in this direction so that, you know, uh, 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 on the climate front, at least on the SDG 13, uh, we, we uh, we do remain um, in the in the green zone. Thank you. Um, I'll go back to you, Raza, but just to continue the discussion on trees. Um, uh, Rab Nawaz, um, the Billion Tree Tsunami and now the 10 Billion Tree Project um, are amongst Pakistan's uh, main green initiatives. Um, so WWF Pakistan was one of the independent monitors um, for the earlier billion tree tsunami that uh, was completed in KP province. Um, and um, I, I remember reading the report and uh, there was a, apparently a high success ratio for the saplings. And um, so what do you think? Do these projects, can they contribute positively in forest cover improvement? Um, can the 10 billion tree project meet its ambitious goals? Um, so yes, we did the independence um, review of the, which was over two or three years, every year we did it. Uh, the, the results were varied. They were in some places quite low where the land was not good, in some places they were quite high. Uh, the average, I think, was about 80 to 85%, if I remember correctly. But I, I think it, it, the project went beyond just plantation. Obviously, planting trees in a, in a country which is high to forest, but their deforestation rate is going to, of course, have good benefits. But the, the benefits, I think, went far beyond that. The, the, the change in attitude towards forests and environments, uh, it started in KP and has become a national campaign now. And I think that's been very organic. And I think that's very much to do with, our, with Pakistan's culture, our religion, that people realize that you plant a tree, you, you plant hope. Um, and I, 
the, the biggest change I saw, and I, I experienced myself, um, I, I went to Malakand to one of the to, to one of the project sites, probably a year, maybe two years after the plantation, and the community had actually voluntarily got rid of their livestock, sent them down to the to the to the plains because they knew livestock was a danger to afforestation. They knew that you, you cannot grow trees when there's thousands of, of uh, goats around. So to me, that was the success. It was a mind change. It was, it was people living in villages in Malakand realizing, and it's not, it, that wasn't really just the environmental um, impact that they, they recognized, it was the economic one, because you can make very good money when you manage your forest. We have very good forests. Uh, I, I think they haven't been managed as well as they should have been. We've lost a lot, unfortunately, but I think the, I think in the last three or four years, we've seen a very, very strict control of, de of deforestation, of, of cutting. Which of course, it's going in, in some places. I've been never going to deny that it's it's uh, it's gone completely. But the attitude and the um, the change in 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 uh, attitude towards the environment is, I think, one of the biggest successes. Uh, I think they also learned a lot. Uh, that was a fantastic learning ground for the ten billion. Um, there were some mistakes made because it was the first time. I think they've learned from that. It's, of course, going to be much more challenging because you've got all the provinces. At that time, KP had a good, had a forest department. It was very forest orientated province. It had a fantastic secretary who just, you know, was really gung ho into getting this done. But I think that's what I, I, I think the, they learned how now to manage this, make it more diverse. There's less emphasis on plantation, more on biodiversity and um, and enclosures. The closures, which is basically natural natural regeneration, is actually more successful than some of the plantations. So I think they're using that, and it's great to see that there's a uh, focus on wildlife, focus on biodiversity in the in 10 BTAP. So is it achievable? It's going to be a challenge, um, but I think yes, uh, inshallah they'll do it. Thank you, Rab Nawaz. Um, going back to you, uh, Raza, can you please, please continue what you were stating earlier and also tell us about the Lahore afforestation pro uh, campaign that you are a part of? Uh, yes. Um, so um, actually, what we just heard uh, kind of helps um, where you talk about the mindset of people changing. And uh, if that is truly changing uh, out there in Malakand, uh, we really need to see that happening in the cities and the urban environments because it is almost non-existent and the driver for this change uh, one of the most important component for this change is uh, to see a matter of urgency uh, in the government agencies to really bring that about now what we are trying to do through afforestation is that uh, trying to create some kind of an example or a pilot uh, that will convince people uh, and the government at the same time that this is all doable uh, but it, this will also need uh, everybody's effort to sort of come through and what the afforestation campaign has done and you know it, it came out of the Lahore Biennale Foundation which is uh, geared towards uh, uh, public art and art in public spaces so it all became a larger conversation about public space and the public space it has become uh, sadly uh, rather uncomfortable because uh, we haven't really thought about designing public spaces or, or how um, user-friendly spaces in the outdoors need to work in, in our cities. And uh, which is why uh, uh, Amin Saab has uh, talked about the heat island effect. Why is it even there? Because we've been uprooting all the trees and uh, to compensate planting them somewhere in a, in a, on a mountain uh, 400 miles away. So the cities have kind of suffered and an afforestation campaign wants to kind of um, mitigate that and, and somehow create um, an in inclusive model where people start to take interest in it and actually start participating in it. Uh, and, and so we need to find um, pilot projects that incentivize people and we have uh, some very good examples uh, that are already in place and there's people who are uh, supporting them in terms of funding. There's people who are giving a lot of their time as volunteers and as experts. And we've gone to the authorities and saying that there are all these people available in the city. So let's create a network and a platform that can actually positively work and include more people in public into it. So that is, that is how the afforestation campaign is, uh, is hoping to, uh, let's say, multiply. 
thank you. And Malik Amin Saab, um, so planting a sapling is the first step and then um, then you need to sort of monitor the growth, right? And so is are you using satellite-based imaging uh, um, to monitor the new growth? Uh, and also, uh, can you tell us about the timber mafia in Pakistan? Is it still very active? Have you managed to, uh, has your government managed to control it somewhat? Uh, yes, and uh, before I do that, uh, let me just pick up from where Raza left. And I think, uh, you know, uh, as uh, Rav Nawaz also pointed out, that the success of the Billion Tree project was the community ownership of the project. And we did that by embedding, you know, uh, incentives within the, uh, for, is, for instance, the natural regeneration process by hiring the Nige Bans from this community and then handing over the forest to them for protection or for plantation, also creating green jobs for the local communities. Similarly, I think the urban forest issue is, is something that needs civil society involvement. It cannot happen without that. The ownership, the monitoring, the, the, you know, the push for the government comes in from there. And, and I would like to commend the Lahore uh, Afforestation Group as you know, they got together in a very organized manner, identified spaces, worked with the, with the local uh, uh, Lahore uh, government to you know, not only identify the land bank for where forestry could be done, but also the spaces where, which could be retrieved back from the land mafias. Because so you talk, we're talking about the timber mafia. Uh, I just talk about that, but the land mafia is a bigger issue in Punjab, where forest land has been encroached upon. Uh, I'll just give you an example of the Baloki forest, where 3,500 acres, uh, just you know, 45 minutes from Lahore, was just encroached upon and taken over by the land mafia. We got that back, and we planted, uh, you know, uh, almost uh, uh, around a thousand acres of that that and it will keep on continuing but the results are amazing you know just after one year you could see green coming back in that whole area and, and you know nature rebounding uh, but uh, uh, these mafias have to be taken on and so you, the civil society organization is very important we have a group in islamabad called reclaim reclaiming green islamabad which is working on that you're a member of that uh, we also have now a group coming up in karachi called the clean green karachi group uh, over there, we have a, you know, uh, although the billion tree project is there, but, uh, you know, urban area, there's a lot of turf war, political, so, but this group is now form, forming in Karachi also. So these groups help the government in pushing this agenda forward uh, with political will. So it's, it's critical for urban forestry to have these uh, civil society groups on board. Uh, on the timber mafia, yes, in, you know, in KP, the timber mafia really ruled the roost. I mean, they were... They were in politics, they were in bureaucracy, they were all over the place. 40% uh, of the revenue of the province was through the sale of timber. And that had all had to change. Uh, when we talked about the changing attitudes in the people, it also, the, there was a change of attitude uh, required in the, in the government ministries also, and the government departments. And, and that could only happen if we had a zero tolerance policy towards the timber mafia. Uh, you know, and, and, and it happened in KP. There were one or two incidents very early on where the timber mafia tried to push the limits. Uh, there were trees cut and you know, they, 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 uh, uh, they were trying to take them away. But then uh, the, our prime minister, who, who was uh, you know, at that time the chairman of the party, uh, we actually went to the spots with the chief minister. And uh, there were, I remember one day uh, in which uh, you know, almost all the forest department people were suspended because nothing could have happened without their uh, connivance. But that sent a very strong signal in, in, in KP that, you know, this is a different government. And that, uh, because of that, uh, when the timber mafia got pushed back, about 600 sawmills, whose business was to just cut down trees and, you know, make them into blocks, got shut down, dismantled. Uh, uh, it, it gave, and, and, you know, for the first time ever, KP started importing timber from Malaysia. Uh, and so it, because it was cheaper to do that. When, when the supply went down, it was cheaper to get uh, wood from uh, outside. So all of this, uh, you know, changed the attitude of the people. And now uh, uh, it, it, it's beginning to sustain. Uh, the government is realizing that a standing tree also has a value. Uh, it's not just the timber value for the tree. There's lots of other benefits that a standing tree provides, not only for KP, but also the whole of Pakistan and the world. So, so I think this is a positive uh, movement. but. Uh, it could not have happened if we had not pushed back the timber park here. Because when, once we did that, we created the space for the government to go in and, and do uh, a positive intervention. Similarly, in Punjab, it was the land mafia which had to be 
uh, it, it's, a, it's an ongoing battle. I mean, I, I can't say that uh, we have won that battle, but we have we've had some uh, wins in this, uh, and it has given signals uh, that you know uh, uh, encroached land uh, should, be for, for especially for the forest land, should be for forests. Uh, and and uh, the attitude of people has changed, and that helps the government always uh, because it creates a positive. And, and and I'll tell you another very interesting aspect that social media I think played a big part in creating this change of attitude because social media is young people it's their future so whenever we had these tweets on uh, you know billion tree tsunami in KP people in Karachi or Lahore would get excited about it we would get a spike in the in the social media readership and that then excites the politics of it because you know a higher social media or a positive social media coverage creates a political capital for the party. So all of it gets linked. Uh, so I think this is a, a positive thing we're on right now. And let's hope we can you know, keep on doing this and, 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 and uh, start changing Pakistan. Thank you, Malik. I mean, and, uh, while we're on the topic of forests and trees, um, can you tell us about the new Protected Areas Initiative? Um, and how can it help us in safeguarding our forests? I mean, the Protected Area Initiative actually uh, was something that we had been thinking of, but ironically, it, it, we, we, we managed to get it designed during the COVID era period. Uh, it was a part of what was called the Green Stimulus. Uh, it had three areas, the Green Stimulus. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, basically it was that we should do things during the COVID era which can protect nature, but also create jobs. So it was a two-pronged uh, objective. And then we identified three further areas that this could be done. Uh, one was the, the 10 billion tree project, which was on the ground, but we put in a trigger to create more jobs uh, for people who are you know, going back from urban to rural areas. And we created about 84,000 jobs during the COVID era. Uh, we then also looked at the protected areas, because that was something that we were already working on that we need to expand the protected areas in Pakistan. Uh, you know, Allah Ta'ala has blessed us with immense beauty. There are places in Pakistan which you cannot find anywhere else in the world. Uh, I mean, I just visited Deosai, you know, that's a case in point. It's already a protected area, but uh, having a plateau of that size at that altitude, uh, we, we haven't even, uh, you know, begun to understand the value of that because uh, it, it, there's no other place in the world where you have such a big plateau at such height, which is covered by uh, snow eight months of the year. And then in the, in the four months that come out, the, the the amount of greenery and the plantations that come out, the flowers and the medicinal plants, uh, we have not yet understood the value of that biodiversity. But there are a lot of places like that in Pakistan. So our objective was to increase the, the protected area from 12 to 15 percent. At the moment, we have 12 percent. And we have already, through the initiative which was launched by the Prime Minister, we have uh, increase uh, the number of national parks by from 30 to 39 so that's a 25 percent increase and I, as i said i was just in the northern areas and we're working on a very exciting project uh, which is to connect uh, kp province to the ajk province and that would be done through a green wildlife national park corridor and there are two areas remaining which, which need to be plugged in uh, by notifying them as protected areas and we are working on those and inshallah we'll do that. And that would be a unique, very unique thing. And you know, it can be linked to ecotourism. It creates uh, revenue from that. We are also uh, starting a national park service to employ youth uh, uh, and we will do that inshallah by the end, end of this year, uh, who can be uh, employed to man these protected areas. Uh, and we are targeting about 5,000 uh, in the first phase. So all of this creates a very positive uh, you know, uh, uh, economy, a green economy. Uh, and, and another uh, an interesting aspect linked with this is that uh, people talk about the money not being available for this. And I you know we've had a very different experience that if we have the right plan and if we have the right will behind it, the money is always available. Even in the COVID stress time period, Pakistan got $120 million from the World Bank for this initiative, which is going to increase employment. Uh, it was the first country in the world which got, you know, uh, uh, funding repurposed for nature protection uh, from the World Bank. So, so the money always follows. Uh, I mean, the dream has to be right, I would say. Thank you. Um, Rab Nawaz, um, what exactly is Pakistan's cover right now? I, there, there's like 
all the way from 5% to 2%. Uh, can you tell us? And also, um, where is deforestation still being carried out and why? And, and can a centralized national park service, such as the one suggested by Malika Bean Saab, I think it's modeled on the one in the US, uh, can it help us in protecting our forests and wildlife? Okay, so I'll, I'll start with the forest cover. Uh, we, we are still waiting for the 2020 figures, which are uh, actually done by FAO. So I can't tell you today exactly what the figures are, but I can tell you when we did the, the inventory for Red Plus, uh, the last figure was in 2016, it was around 4.9 million hectares or 4.8. Uh, and we have seen a, a, a gradual decline over the years of about, about 100,000 people take. Uh, I hope that the the figures now because if you look at if you look at um btap that was about 350,000 hectares of of uh, plantation and forestation even if you say okay not all survived i i hope that there's going that there's going to probably not going to be a huge increase but I, I hope that that rate of decline is going to stop and i it can be done we've seen in mangroves uh, we saw the same thing we saw a very very steep decline uh, we, we came together with the government of SIN, with IUCN, and we actually managed to bend the curve. Now, if you look at mangroves, uh, they went down to, I think, 86,000 hectares, and they've, they've actually gone up above 100. So I expect the 2020 figures to, to reflect the, at least the forest cover. And we should not get hung up about the area. We need quality forest. Uh, it's fine to plant, you know, if you planted uh, 500,000 hectares of eucalyptus, you know, it'll look good on the map, but honestly, it'll have no... No benefit. So it's the right trees in the right places, which I think what what is what we learned from uh, BTAP is is where to put the right trees and the to, and the right approach. So when it comes to deforestation, I agree with Malik Sub KP has not eradicated it, but you could not go and buy illicit timber now as easy as you could five or six or ten years ago. It's not there. People are very very wary about having illicit wood, which is fantastic. The awareness in the markets and the forest department. So other places like some places in uh, uh, in Punjab and Butchistan, we still have a way to go. We're still seeing uh, loss of mangroves, unfortunately, around Karachi. So there are, there are hot spots where deforestation is going on, but I think that whole attitude now of the importance of forests, you're going to see. And then, inshallah, I think in a few years, you're going to see that that decline stop, and you're going to see the the trend going up, which is going to be a fantastic, fantastic milestone for for Pakistan. To the to the Park Service, yes, I think a centralised approach is 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 good. Uh, I think pr provinces can manage their parks very well. I think there's there's there are obviously some lack of capacity in some places, but I think parks in general, some are, are very good. Some are not so good, but I think there are places where parks, national parks, wildlife sanctuaries have been working. They've been involving the community. GB was at the model, I think, for, for community-based uh, participation. But I think the advantage of, of, a, of a national park service at the federal level is looking at the overall picture, because we know that you know, uh, a lot of our species are, for example, mig migratory, and we need to make sure that there are sufficient protected areas all along the migratory route of the Indus River, for example, that they are provided protection, they're managed. There are species which, for example, in GP or on the, on the appendix, so it's illegal to have them, but in Karachi and Sindh, it's not. So you need to have that uh, national approach to maybe common finds and uh, a, a common way of, of managing national parks. You've got all, all of our national parks water-based. Uh, you need to make sure there's enough water for for the delta, which is actually a protected area. It's not a national park, but it is a Ramsar site, it's a wildlife sanctuary. So you need an overlooked picture of how to manage national parks. And I think if they, if everyone, everyone has good intention uh, to make this work, I think this would be a fantastic way forward to managing. Like Malik Sub said, we have the most spectacular scenery in the world. And I had to, I've been fortunate to see the mud volcanoes um, all the way up to the to the Indus dolphins through through the most beautiful conifer forests, and you know seeing some of the highest peaks in the world. It is one of the most uh, amazing countries, I and mean, we need to. It, that's a, a benefit, but you also need to make sure it doesn't become a, uh, an, a, a it's not overexploited. So tourism, sustainable tourism, definitely is a way forward. 
we make we want to make sure and that's where i think we definitely looked up to mocc and, and also the provincial departments to make sure that we manage these resources in a way they're not here for the next generation but the one after and the one after and the one after that thank you Rabnavaz. um and now raza um we've had national parks um, in the past and they've been uh, I mean, there have been a lot of problems with local communities living in and around the park areas. And, and so they've remained, you know, for the large part, they've remained paper parks. And um, so how can this new initiative be more effective and how do you involve the local communities? And, and also when uh, there's going to be more and more tourism, our prime minister is calling for that. And won't a mass scale tourism cause more problems in the long run? Uh, well, you know, firstly, um, uh, I just want to clarify that, you know, we're not centralizing the National Park Service uh, in the federal government. It will be with the provinces. But what we are doing is that, uh, you know, previously we just had these uh, paper notified parks. So, you know, the notification was done and that was the end of it. So we want to change that and we want to make sure that whatever is notified also gets protected. And to do that, what we've done is that uh, we've uh, picked up seven national parks, one in, one in each region. So, it's, you know, uh, the pro provinces, GB, AJK, and uh, the Islamabad territory, uh, one in each region. And, and in that, we have, we will be setting up the management plan, we'll be setting up the National Park Service, but then we'll also be transferring it back to the uh, provincial governments to replicate and, and, and enhance. And already there is a very good response. You know, in Punjab, we've had some very good new national parks uh, being set up. Uh, I was just discussing yesterday that. A few of our plantation, uh, the old plantations, which were meant for like Changa Manga, Chichavati, Kamalia, all of these were meant for the railways uh, during the British times. So, you know, they, they fed the railways uh, and, uh, with sustainable uh, forests. But now that railway doesn't require it, we should not be cutting down these trees. So there is a move to convert them into national parks, which will, uh, you know, protect these forests as far as plantation forests and not make them into, you know, sustainably harvesting for us. Uh, so that's one move which is occurring in Punjab. Uh, two, three uh, very big national parks have already been notified in Punjab. Uh, similarly, in, in, in GB, where I've recently visited, there's, a, as I said, very, very exciting <coughs> initiative taking place and some new national parks coming up. So all of these are, are because of the federal government, government acting as a catalyst, uh, you know, not centralizing it, but acting as a catalyst to push these uh, uh, initiatives, to recognize them, and to recognize wh whichever uh, province is doing well on it, and you know, to give it a national uh, sort of uh, uh, recognition uh, in terms of the park. Uh, uh, so, so these these these, uh, these uh, pilot national parks will be uh, what will bring out uh, uh, all these these benefits. Uh, you talked about tourism. I'm, I mean, I'm also very concerned about that. In Pakistan, tourism is exploding. But what we have right now is, I won't call it mass tourism, I would go a step ahead and call it, you know, locust tourism. Because these people, you know, it just goes and eats up everything and then it wants the next site. So we want to regulate that. We have to regulate that. Uh, as a first step in our ministry, we're trying to do it uh, very strongly within the national park boundaries and the buffer zones. So that, you know, it's properly regulated. Whatever infrastructure is built has to have proper regulations, you don't get these, you know, Lal Pila buildings coming up all around the national parks. It has to be a proper uh, architectural regulation. You already got some, some basis for that, basic drawings for that. Uh, the other one is, uh, you know, how to regulate the numbers. So it's not, you know, I was in Deosai and in one day about 700 cars crossed over. Uh, I think that should not be allowed. There should, has to be a, a, a restriction on the number of people who can come in. You can you should, you should you should be able to buy you know these these tickets to go to these national parks in advance like it happens all over, all over the world. But highly sensitive ecological zones should not be open to mass tourism. Uh, I'm totally against that. So we're fighting. You know the other side is that provinces want the revenue that comes with this 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 mass tourism. Uh, so so we are up against that. We 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 are, we've got the green flag in our hands. So we're fighting for ecologically sensitive. Uh, and responsible to them. Okay, thank you, Malik Amin Sab. Uh, Raza, so on one hand, we're uh, developing all these national parks, right? And on the other hand, we're developing the river, 
the front property or city or whatever you want to call it. What do you have to say to that? Well, I'll start with the national parks, though, um, and especially this whole excitement about tourism, which is great. And uh, I agree with both gentlemen that we have uh, an amazing uh, country uh, to um, sort of enjoy and we are proud of it. But uh, we have to uh, be careful because uh, we know how we develop areas uh, and uh, we know how we have handled them so far. I mean, if, if, if you ask me the ideal scenario, if, if, if Malik Amin Saab can uh, help out, is that you, know, you, you should ideally have zero development in all of these areas right now until you properly map and properly record what's there. That includes population of all kinds of species and more importantly, the human beings, because you want to make sure that people don't develop blindly wherever they think they can. You have to allocate the areas and the capacities of those areas that can take future development, especially for tourism. Um, because there's a term I use with my friends a lot, which is called the Murray effect. The Murray effect has reached Naran already. And what that means is that uh, most people that I've heard of going up north, um, you know, they make a face when you talk about Murray and Naran. And that's exactly what's going to happen with all these beautiful places that you're talking about, unless you um, kind of really think it through in terms of a really long-term development and you have to go slow because we are very excited people and uh, we, don't, we don't think twice. So uh, I hope something like this can happen all across Pakistan because there's a lot of amazing sites in Sindh and in Balochistan, there's religious tourism and there's a lot of stuff. So I hope something like that can happen uh, in time. And to go back to the, the, the next part of your question, uh, Rina, that Yes, um, uh, are we kind of pushing and pulling in two different directions? Um, uh, I'm afraid we are. Uh, and um, the Ravi project is right now um, a, a, a very hot topic. Uh, and the concerns are very, very um, sort of obvious and simple. Um, uh, we were very excited when, and we were very impressed when the current government came up with the announcement that uh, they need to uh, get a hold on sprawl. We don't need sprawling cities anymore. And no more farmland can be, let's say, um, converted into development land. And we should think about more um, denser cities uh, and, and think about reusing spaces within the cities more, and which was absolutely perfect. Uh, for all of 44 kilometers uh, and completely disregards um, all of the issues that kind of uh, prompted the first plan in the first place. So, um, but Ravi is right now in its uh, very early stages of, of uh, sort of revival, if you want to call it, because it's an old project. Every government comes and gives it uh, a little bit of flavor in their own way. Um, the custodians of the project, the LDA, were on TV. Uh, uh, and they uh, sort of uh, spelt it out that there is no real demand for this thing. They even spelt out that there is no money for this and people of Lahore will pay for it. Uh, five trillion, if we can give you, I don't know. Uh, give me some of it too, please. But there is a positive part of it, uh, which is that um, they talked about uh, cleaning up um, the water recharge. There's going to be water recharge. They need, let's say, sewerage. Um, uh, plants and a lot of uh, sewer management systems. Uh, those are really being supported as these great parts of this Ravi development project. Those are actually parts that we've been robbed of for the last 70 years. So that's not a new development plan. That's what um, we've been waiting for for years. And if they can just do that for a start, that would be great. Um, but the city really needs a lot of attention, like I said in the beginning. There are great initiatives out in the mountains in the countryside, but the urban, um, the health of our urban centers is, is really in, in a, I mean, I don't have to explain that to you. You read the papers every day, you know what's going on in Karachi, you know what's happening in Lahore, and uh, you know, in, we, we're a mess. So we need, we need, if you ask me, what, what is it going to take? Um, I think it's going to take some kind of 
a champion and some kind of a leadership role and some massive urgency. Uh, we need to see that from the government. We need to see that from the city administration. Uh, all over the world, there is a mayor who's going, um, you know, uh, all four corners of the city trying to sell the city, trying to make plans for the city, trying to fix the city. Um, we cannot do that because we have a number of departments doing a number of things on their own and um, that creates chaos and uh, there's nobody to bring them together. So uh, we, need, we need some serious consideration in our cities because there's nobody to own them. Um, and uh, just, a, just a civil society is not the answer. I mean, we, we, we can give you examples. We can make pilot projects for you. We can bring in volunteer experts. Um, so uh, Malika means I was right to say that the, the, the civil society plays a very, very crucial role in this. Um, but sir, that's not the only role that's required. We need, we, need, we need a lot more of a backbone that has to come from the administration. And, and certainly uh, uh, not Ravi. Um, I must point out, uh, and, and the two gentlemen here uh, probably know more than I do about this, um, we dream, and, uh, dream of Ravi development and sell it as if you're by the River Thames or something. Uh, it's not that kind of a river. It's not that kind of soil. Uh, rivers need a certain kind of um, um, insurance in, 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 in the form of floodplains that have to be preserved. People have to stay away from them. You need some kind of uh, a balance of biodiversity, landscape, um, security. And you cannot just step in there and reclaim it and change the entire sort of, sort of structure of the river just to make some new shiny tall buildings, which we really don't need. So we've learned that lesson already. If you look at where Lahore is today, it's because of the same very process. So let's probably get together and, 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 and avoid that. But I hope we'll see that day very soon. Uh, thank you, Raza. Uh, Malik Amin Sa, would you like to respond to Raza? Yes, uh, uh, I said most certainly. Uh, uh, I think that the, the Ravi project we, have, we already had a, a meeting with the Lahore Conservation Society, and I personally, you know, totally believe that the ecology of the river, the floodplains, need to be protected as a nature zone or a national park, uh, and you don't need development com coming into that zone. Uh, the plan which is there on the table, which is you know just a draft plan at, the, at this time. Uh, is something different. I mean, it's uh, it's more of a concretization of the river, uh, which I think uh, would be not only dangerous but also would create uh, uh, you know issues much larger than that. But we have, you know this is a dialogue which is going on right now. Uh, as I said, I believe that this is the right way to go, which is to save the ecology of the river, and then you can have your development uh, uh, you know outside of that. Uh, so, uh, but it's a dialogue which is at the moment going on. I've already talked about this in the meetings of the, uh, the NCOC where this is being discussed in the presence of the Prime Minister. Uh, so we need to you know, keep on pushing on this uh, particular front. And you know, when, when you keep on, and I mean keep on pushing that, that is some where the civil society can help uh, the government uh, you know, by, by putting it in the media, keep on pushing it so that we, we at the end of the day get the right result in place. I also would agree with, uh, with Raza that we do urban areas need champions and you know the local government system after it's finished off uh, that those champions are not there in the big cities. Uh, 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 so we need the champion but we also need the, the right side of right sort of champion so you know or the right sort of mayor to be coming in who understands these issues. There is a heightened awareness of the issues in the urban areas but we now need to elect the right people so that they can come in and, and flag them as issues of the city and, and fight for them and also bring all the, uh, all the uh, departments together. Uh, with the lack of the local government, that is, that is an area which is missing right now. So I think that is required. Uh, the government is committed to doing that in the, in the next uh, five, six months to have a local government in place. And hopefully, if we get the right mayor for Lahore and Karachi, uh, they'll at least push things in the right uh, direction. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, we're running out of time, but I want to bring Rav Nawaz back into the discussion. So, uh, Rav Nawaz, I mean, um, as the world slowly recovers from the pandemic, is going back to business as usual um, an option? And what, can, what more can Pakistan do to protect our animals and our plants and our wildlife? 
Right. So, um, no, we can't go back to usual. We, we've seen where that usual is, where it's going to take us. It's going to take us into an economic and environmental disaster. Uh, <laughs> climate is not about carbon anymore. It's about biodiversity. It's about livelihoods. It affects everybody. If you don't accept that, then you do need to find another planet. What can we do, Pakistan? I think that a lot of the steps the MSCC has taken is great. I think a lot of the, I mean, I would just give one, and I'm going to be very, uh, I'm going to pitch this with is a WF uh, initiative with MSCC is Recharge Pakistan. We've talked about water. Water and climate are the nexus, a new ne or the next nexus of Pakistan. We are running out of water. I wouldn't say it's because we don't have enough. It's because it's it's poorly managed. Uh, just very briefly, we are, we are taking, looking at 2010 floods, which were seen as a disaster, and floods are not a disaster for Pakistan, they were a blessing. We need to change that, that what the project's about is actually changing that um, image of, of floods as a disaster and the catastrophe and turning them into basically the lifeline of Pakistan. So it's, it's using existing wetlands and it's uh, using nature-based solutions we don't need conservation environment to me is not about money we don't need a lot of money to do this you obviously need funding but it's all about good intentions it's all about working together uh and again looking forward i think we need to we need to be more integrated um our departments need to be, be talking together so my have talked about tourism and and other departments, we need to be talking to irrigation department, we need to be talking to health departments now because COVID is a health issue. So I think better integration across the provinces, across the departments is the key. As an environmentalist, I think environment must be number one for, for Pakistan. I saw there was a, a, uh, a question I think someone put forward is, is climate change a national security issue? I think not yet, but it can become one. We share our water resources with other countries. Um, without water, we you, you can you can make electricity, you can't make water. So I think we really do need to focus on making sure that our, our water issues are sorted. It cannot be a provincial issue. It has to be a national challenge and a national solution. So for me, I think moving forward, the water. Uh, climate change is always going to be a, a challenge, but I think what uh, the government's come up with in the last few months for the for the green stimulus, I think, is uh, a lot of good steps towards making Pakistan greener and cleaner. You on mute? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rab Nawaz. I think we've run out of time, but I'd like to give uh, Malik Amin Saab the last word. Uh, do you think we can go back to business as usual as we come out of the pandemic? No, uh, certainly not. I think that's not what we can do because this COVID era has taught us a lot of lessons. One is that, you know, you have to respect the boundaries of nature. If you don't, then nature would always strike back. And this is what happened with the, with the zoonotic disease that we, uh, you know, suddenly got into. And so, secondly, you know, that, uh, you know, Nature is all about being a global. It does not respect boundaries. So what, have, what happened in a very small area of the world quickly spread all over the world. Uh, and the third thing, which is a positive thing, is that nature, if given space, always rebounds back very quickly. So I think it's the, it's the third point that we need to focus on. Uh, and we need to uh, you know, build back green or go back green into the, uh, with a green recovery. Uh, Pakistan, luckily, is one of the few countries which has already devised a plan, announced the plan of green stimulus, and we're already working on that, which includes the tree planting, the protected areas initiative, and the clean green initiative, which is uh, deal dealing with waste management in cities. With, on these three lines, we would be uh, moving in a different direction. You've got the funds uh, also allocated through the World Bank, so you will be getting a lot of green jobs, so that people start owning up to the green environmental agenda and become stakeholders in that whole process. Uh, the, the, one of the very other interesting things that we are working on, and we have a meet call this week on that is, is called the debt for biodiversity swap or, 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 or nature bond. Uh, so there are countries who are talking with Pakistan in terms of debt retirement, but they want, in, in lieu of that debt retirement, they want certain biodiversity targets to be met. And we are already in that direction. So we are, we are very excited about that whole thing. And if that happens, that automatically pushes us towards you know the nature-based solutions that Rabnu talked about 
uh, already you know the, the protected area and the billion tree projects are are nature based solutions uh, so uh, I, to answer your question i think pakistan needs to build back green uh, using nature based solutions and uh, going in a different direction uh, because you know the direction that we were headed in brought us the covid pandemic we don't want to be in that situation again thank you and I, I think I have to give Raza the last, last word as well. Uh, Raza, so do you think we're going to go back to business as usual or do you think we've learned anything from the pandemic? Um, thank you. Uh, yes, I hope we don't go back to business as usual um, because there's much to learn, of course, like the two gentlemen have pointed out. I think moving forward, um, there has to be um, a concerted effort towards um, education and towards the realization and redefinition of what resources mean to us um, and uh, how um, uh, you know our lifestyles like all across the board have to now take these things into account very very seriously and i think this kind of awareness um, which obviously uh, uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge supporter of um, such efforts for really young children this has to be this has to begin right now um, because we who crossed um, the age of 50 will never learn. Uh, but I think there's still time and I think um, uh, there have to be a lot of resources um, allocated to people who are going to be very active 20 years from now. I think it's very, very important. Thank you, everyone. We've run out of time. I'm sorry I didn't really ask all the questions that were sent, but uh, it was a fascinating discussion. I've learned a lot. I hope everybody learned a lot. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.